Hey, good morning, East Point. It's so great to be here with all of you. Let's stand together and worship. Savior who gave his life. 
let's pray So may we die daily Our pride lay to rest His kingdom is humble And the broken Thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your love for us. It is so undeserving. And God, I just want to thank you for your faithfulness. We know, we've seen in our own lives, 
We've seen in the lives of our family and our friends, and we've seen in your word that you have always been faithful and you always will be. God, I just thank you so much for that. And right now I want to I want to pray the the lyrics that we just sang over us that you would please teach us. Teach us to love, teach us to serve. God, we want to see people the way that Jesus does. And only you can help us with that. It can only be through you that we can love others. And God, we just I just ask you right now that you would teach us how to do that. God, thank you. We continue to sing praises to you in worship this morning. Thank you for who you are. Pray this in your name. Amen.
Well, this beautiful thing happens when we worship God. He recalibrates our hearts. He reorients our hearts because our attention is focused on him. You know, Jesus reminds us in Matthew chapter 13, he, he gives us this parable of a few different soils, one being the, the road, another one being the rocky soil, the third being the soil with the weeds, and then the fourth being the good soil where the crop grows up to produce a, a huge harvest. And that the soil, it's an illustration of our heart state before the Lord. And I think for many of us, oftentimes, at least for myself, I can fall into that third category, the soil with the weeds sprouting up. And Jesus tells us that the weeds, the weeds are the worries of life. It's the deceitfulness of, of wealth, right? Sometimes when we go through our week, we, all of a sudden we're, we're worried about our job obligations, uh, the sporting events that we have coming up, uh, the, the kids' events that we have after, after school or whatever it might be, the bills that come in the mail. And all these weeds start to sprout up. All these worries and cares begin to sprout up and they choke out our spiritual life in our abiding with Jesus. But this beautiful thing happens when we get in settings like this, when we get into settings like in our chair time, in the secret place, we focus our attention on God and all of those cares, all of those worries get put right back into our place. When we worship God, it's like we bring him our heart and we say, till the soil of my heart, Jesus. Do the gardening, do the weeding that I can't do myself. Is anyone happy to have Jesus tilling the soil of their heart this morning? Yeah, ministering to you this morning? You know, as we keep this posture of worship, we're gonna just go into that offering time that we always go into at this point in the service. And, and many of you, I know you give in the offering boxes on your way in, you give on the app, you give online. We just wanna say thank you so much. And as you, you give to the Lord in whatever way you see fit this morning, I just wanna encourage you to make it a, a posture of worship as you give to, to God this morning. As you give to him, you're saying, God, here's my heart, here's my priorities, till the soil of my heart and do what only you can do, Jesus, in this act of worship before you. So let's pray for our offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you so much for your goodness. God, we thank you, Jesus, that you gave it all for us, that you came to this earth, that you lived a life that we could not live. You lived a standard that we couldn't attain ourselves. You bore a yoke that we couldn't bear. And so Jesus, we just thank you for that. We thank you that you laid down your life on the cross, that you were buried, and then better, you rose again in resurrection victory. And now you give to us freely. You pour your Holy Spirit on us freely. You give us mercy, you give us grace, you give us life eternal with you. And so from that state, God, Whatever we choose to give back to you, let it be from a place of worship and gratitude in our hearts. Would you bless our offering this morning? We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, so we're going to do what we did last week. And uh, I know some of us introverts in the room, our hand, palms are getting sweaty already. But we're going to go ahead and say hi to some of the people around you. We recognize this is a big church family, but we want it to feel like a family. We want you to know the people around you. So take a couple minutes and uh, say hi to some of the people who are sitting next to you.
Oh, good morning, good morning, good morning, church. How are we this morning? Okay, you extroverts, it's time to settle down. I'm just kidding. Oh, it is good. It's so much fun. And if you heard an eruption, yes, that was my daughter as we were walking out of the auditorium today. But it's good. She didn't want to leave worship, right? Okay, maybe it was not good. Maybe. <laughs> hey, look, I just want to invite everybody in this room to this coming Friday night. From 6 p.m. to midnight, we are seeking the Lord's face on behalf of this region. We are praying for God to do something only He can do, asking Him to do all that we could ever imagine or conceive by His Spirit here in Greater Portland. And we know that God's Spirit moves as a result of effective prayer and petitioning. Jesus points us to the graciousness of God when it comes to us praying and asking, seeking and knocking. And so if you dare, show up at 6 p.m. on Friday. We're gonna be here in, I think, the student lounge, a little more intimate, a little closer. And we're gonna seek after the Lord through worship and prayer and directed prayer. And we're gonna, we're gonna ask him to just move. This isn't for us, though it's so sweet sometimes to come together and, and just allow God to wash us in his presence in an hour or two. This is more of a directive. Lord, we want you to do something here in greater Portland that only you can do. And I believe it's the result of a church being faithful to continue praying. So this, this Friday, 6 p.m., join us for our prayer gathering. And uh, welcome to those tuning in online. We're so glad you're with us. Welcome to any guests. We had a lot of people join us for the first time, first service. And if that's you today, we're so glad you're here. Welcome. We'd love to connect with you and discover East Point after the service. It's right in front of the welcome desk. And uh, tuning in online, our friends over at Cumberland County Jail. We're so glad to have you tuning in. Don't sleep on that Cumberland County campus. God is doing some mighty things in those spaces and raising up men and women who are hungry for the person and presence of Jesus. And isn't that who Jesus ministered through all through his ministry? We're people that knew I'm bankrupt in spirit without him. And so thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of our church family. And we look forward to connecting with you when you arrive. And we are going to host you well. So this morning as we continue uh, second part of Simple Kingdom, this new series we're going through as we look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Last week we saw Jesus begin with this incredible uh, preamble, the, the Beatitudes, the, the picture of who can inherit this new kingdom. And, and then he commissioned not himself and the kingdom he brings, but he commissioned the brokenhearted, the disciples, those who would disqualify themselves most likely. He said, no, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so as Jesus continues in his teaching, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5, starting in 17, this idea of Jesus fulfilling the law. <clears throat> I said that with a crack in my voice. Hold on. The law, right? <laughs> this, this thing that we hear about as we read through our Bibles or we look through the text, it seems very important, but many of us, we could misunderstand the law. And so I just want to start with a story today, a story about a 30-year-old man in the year 1620 who was looking at a a future landscape that he would hope he could help usher in a group of people to enjoy religious freedom, economic opportunity, and out from the heavy hand of the Church of England. This man was a part of a group called the Protestants. They were a result of the Reformation that was sweeping the land in Western Europe that was unlocking the scripture from the pulpits of priests. And so people began having access to the word on their own and recognizing this beautiful gospel from Jesus. And it started what we now know today as the Reformation. And it developed these people that were the Protestants. And now William Bradford is this 30-year-old man who spent the last 11 years in a country we know as Holland, thinking that that might be a suitable place to run from England and enjoy freedom of worship and economic opportunity. Little did he know, he would run into one of the most secular countries, even to this day, and they loved having English immigrants because they put them to work eight hours a day, or eight, eight days a week, 25 hours a day. 
So not what you would call economic opportunity. So they charted their course. They contracted a vessel that we know as the Mayflower and a hundred pilgrims boarded this Mayflower with William Bradford and the Eatons, Samuel and Francis Eaton, and they got on the Mayflower heading for a land of economic opportunity, spiritual and religious freedom. This new land that they were charting was the Virginias. Now, the Virginia colonies has, had expanded beyond what we now know as Virginia, but it hadn't expanded all the way up to the area that their boat, the Mayflower, was about to land, right? They thought they were aiming for the Hudson River. That's where they would make their port of entry and they'd arrive in an already established colony. But they found themselves about 150 nautical miles north of the Hudson River in a, the land we now know as Cape Cod, the promised land. No? <laughs> So they stepped off on this extremely underwhelming rock known as Plymouth Rock. If anyone's ever seen it, you don't need to go. It's not that overwhelming, right? But this is where they were to land. And there was one issue with Plymouth Colony or with, with Plymouth Plantation, Plymouth Colony, the area of Cape Cod is it was not under the jurisdiction of the Virginia colonies. So there was no law and order of the land. And a mixed company of over 200 passengers on this vessel with all mixed motives, they weren't all pilgrims. Some of them were merchants and traders and some of the people had different ideas than religious freedom. William Bradford and a few other leaders knew there had to be law and order established before stepping off the boat. There had to be some sort of structure to live into because people left to their own devices, tell me if this is true in your life, are a little self-centered a little prideful, a little egotistical, and they care more about what they have than anybody else. Isn't that the case? And so they're not necessarily the most righteous passengers. And so William Bradford and a few others set out to establish a law of the land over these people. And so in what we now know as the Mayflower Compact, just over 200 words were drafted to establish rule and order. And this is how they started the Mayflower Compact having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith in honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Do by these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant, a covenant, and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and our preservation. William Bradford had the foresight to know if we land on this unclaimed territory, violence and strife is only going to result. And I believe it's because he knew his Bible. This is a guy deeply committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, deeply committed to the freedom that Jesus had brought and ushered in after the cross. And this is a man who knew that God's kingdom was one of order, one of reign and rule, but also one of covenant. Not just a contractual promise, not just a set of laws, but this, this, un, this binding promise that they make as a community of people to live for one another for their own flourishing and preservation. And you know, I, I, think, I think back to the, to the early passages of the Bible where we see God on Mount Sinai, holy trembling the people of Israel that we talked about last week, that they didn't even wanna come up the side of the mountain because if God spoke to them, they would die. And yet I look to this passage in the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five, six, and seven of Matthew, and I wonder if Bradford and his companions drafting this Mayflower Compact were thinking about the Sermon on the Mount, that their savior, the Spirit of God who lives in them and was motivating them on this journey had a rule and reign, a kingdom to live into when they approached this new world. Because Israel went through this, right? Israel left a land of persecution, a land where they were under the heavy hand of some authority known as Pharaoh. And they come up out of Egypt after God has commissioned a prophet named Moses and they start making their way through the promised land. And God doesn't just let them usher their way into the promised land. He comes and meets them and says, I have a framework for you to live under. I have a, a law, a set of commands that is good for your preservation, good for your flourishing because you've been in Egypt a long time, Israel. 
You've been formed and fashioned in ways you don't even realize because of the culture that you've been exposed to. And I think the church today might not recognize how much we're formed and fashioned by the culture we're living in. Right? When Jesus ushers in the Sermon on the Mount, the kingdom of God to rule and reign in our lives, that we try to have our cake and eat it too with the culture. We try to say, well, Egypt got these things right, right? The Church of England, London got these things right, and this looks like the kingdom. Let's just blend it. And God's saying, no, 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 not my people. Not my people. There's only one authority in your life. One authority in your life. And it's the commands from God, from Yahweh, a loving father who steps into our lives and says, it says, come, you're mine now. And so today, as we look at this passage, I want to set the table because Jesus hasn't come to take what we might think of the law as this heavy burden, this almost curse. Like Jesus hasn't come to say, hey, let me just take that away from you and send it into the abyss. No, Jesus actually starts out this portion of the Sermon on the Mount and he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but I've come to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Right? Jesus is looking at at a group of people that he describes later on as, as people that are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And they're under this weight, this this deeply entrenched understanding of the law that had been passed down generation to generation to generation in the people of Israel. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the religious leaders are putting all of this extra weight and all these people are saying, Jesus, just take this yoke off me. This is heavy. This is a burden. And Jesus is getting back to the essence and saying, don't think that I've come to abolish the law. We'll see later on that he comes to set the Pharisees, the religious rulers, the Sadducees in place. But I've not come to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill the law. And so for us, just to give some context with the law, I want to start us back just after the Garden of Eden. God finds a man who inherently himself predisposed toward righteousness. His name's Abram, and we know him as Abraham. Right, that Abraham was counted righteous for his faith, not his wealth, not his intelligence, not his strategy, not his Bible knowledge, for his faith. His willingness to be obedient, even when it doesn't make sense, even when he doesn't even know the results. He just says, Lord, I believe your promise and I'm taking an action. I'm taking a step. I'm being obedient. Right? So I won't call anybody out in this room, but anybody that's over the age of 80, if God comes and tells you, be excited, I'm going to give you a child. I'm sure everyone here would say, I've always wanted a child in my 80s. Right? I've always, I've been looking forward to this actually, Lord, for the last 80 years to finally raise a child at this stage in life. But he promised Abraham he'd have as many descendants as there is sand on the seashore. And Abraham believed him. Not only did Abraham believe him for who would become Isaac after Ishmael. God says, do you trust me? Do you believe me? Are you a man of righteousness? I'm going to invite you to a place where you're going to have to lay your son on the altar. But I'll provide a way of deliverance. Right, that Abraham was a man of action and righteousness and faith, but that didn't carry on down through the gene pool. Right, we see things get real bad real quick in the first few books of the Bible. But through the end of Genesis, we see Abraham's descendants finding their way settling in a land that we know as Egypt. And it seems like this is a good place. Right, refugees taking under the hand of the king, the Pharaoh at that time, It looks like they're the holy refugees. They're going to get good treatment. Well, fast forward a few generations and we pick up an exodus where the Israelites have gone from refugees to indentured servants. About a million people. Free labor for Pharaoh to build anything he wants. 
And so God finds a prophet named Moses. And we all think of Moses as this mighty leader of the Israelites. <laughs> Moses says, me? You want me? I killed a guy 40 years ago. You want me to do what? Let me remind you that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Just know that in your life. When we sit there and say, me? You want me to do what? You want me to share Jesus with who? I can't do that. That's impossible. Imagine God saying, you're going to free a million of my children from the most powerful man in the world and you need to walk into his throne room. He's like, I have a stutter. Jesus says, I don't care, right? I'm going to use you to deliver my people. And so some of us know the story. Everything fast forwards. Pharaoh gets crushed under the mighty hand of God through signs and wonders. And so Moses takes his people out into the promised land. They cross through the Red Sea. They're wandering around the desert. And then God says, finally, now that I've delivered, delivered you out of this corrupt, crooked culture of the Egyptians, it's time to set the rule law in order. Imagine Bradford, William Bradford, coming to this unknown land, looking at these people who are tired and ragged on this boat, recognizing if we don't have law and order, rule and reign, and understanding a covenant promise, we're not going to make it. And I think he's taking a playbook out of God, God's law, where God says, I'm going to give you a framework to live into for your own flourishing and preservation, people of Israel. And for God, it wasn't just a matter of, hey, I want you to behave better. God's intent was that he could dwell with his people. Imagine Yahweh, glorious God, saying, let me come and dwell with you. Fire by night, cloud by day, tabernacle moving with you. The immense, glorious presence of God dwelling among his people, Israel. But he says, there's got to be some ground rules before I move in. All the 613 commands that God hands down to Moses and Moses declares to the people Israel in the first five books of the Bible are all meant to allow Israel to receive the perfect holy presence of God in their midst. And so Jesus says, I'm not, I'm not coming here to abolish that at all. Actually, the inherent beauty of the law is why I've come to fulfill it because God still wants to dwell with his people. And so now for us on this side of the cross, for us in Christ Jesus, for those that declare him as Lord, that walk with him, God no longer wants to dwell in a tabernacle. God no longer wants to dwell in this cloud of smoke that leads us or fire by night to guide us. He dwells inside of us by his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, the one who radiated in the tabernacle says, move, move over, I'm coming in. And he's the one that rules and reigns and guides us by his kingdom. But the, the, fra the, the law itself that God handed down was this framework of his kingdom, right? It's this structure. It's this, this understanding that this is where the house is going to get built upon. Imagine you're, you're in a construction project. You're building a home. I know there's some people in here that might be in that process, right? Praying for you. But when you build the house, the framing goes up pretty soon thereafter, right? The framing's all up and do you move in then? No, be a little chilly in February, right? But the framing is the beginning. It's the bones, it's the structure, but it's not a home yet. And so this continued story of God's redemptive plan is giving this framework for rule, law, and order to expose the heart of man to say, you, you're not going to be able to make it. You're not going to be able to be self-righteous. You're not going to be able to strive this way into your life. You're going to need a deliverer. And so the framework is not invaluable. It's important to recognize what it is, though. His law is a framework of the kingdom. It's this structure for his people, Israel, to live into. And so as we consider what Jesus is saying here, I'm not abolishing it whatsoever. I'm coming to move into it. And so Jesus continues on and he says, therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands, 613 of them, whoever sets these aside and ignores them, and if they teach others accordingly, they'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands, oh, they will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Again, Jesus continues to keep layering it on. The law is good. Don't go left or right. 
Don't try to create a new way. Don't try to, try to subvert the conviction and the repentance that comes from living in the kingdom. If anyone is teaching people to do that, if anyone is leading people astray, if anyone is giving a corrupt or a fashioned gospel, woe to them. Woe to them. For us as a church, one or two degrees off over the course of time, you can get pretty far away, can't you? And so it's so important. Jesus is saying the, the essence of the law is good. Do not throw any of this away because you'll go wayward. And we're going to see with the Pharisees, they added to it. They manipulated it. They were tithing their dill, mint, and cumin. Imagine going home to your cupboards and saying, oh Lord, what is 10% of my cumin and my dill? <laughs> Here, Kenan, here's my offering, right? Like you're sitting there going, what? They took it right down to the iota of the law and they missed the whole point that it was about the person and presence of God. And he wasn't even in the temple at the time. And so this, this little creep left or right for the church today can get us so far off that we miss the person and presence of God. Lights, speakers, platforms, gatherings, doesn't mean that the Spirit of God is here. But when there's conviction, there's repentance, there's sacrifice, there's hunger, there's encounter, the Word of God is alive and active in the church, the Spirit of God is leading us to become more like Him, man, look out, Portland, because the gospel is coming in transformative power. The person and presence of God is what's gonna motivate us to live in the fulfillment of the law as a church. And so for us, we can't just take the grace card with Jesus and just put it in our back pocket that it's just get out of jail free. Standing there again, condemned. I know I shouldn't have done it, but hey, the gospel's pretty good, isn't it? I love the forgiveness. I get to walk free, right? Right, like we can sometimes, we can take advantage of it. At least we can take it for granted. And Jesus is saying, do not toss aside these commands. Do not abuse the graciousness of the Father. Don't turn it into a religion. Walk in relationship. And so I want to take both of these, this, this idea of commands and this idea of a framework, right? And I want to paint this picture of what would have happened in that whole Galilee region. You can still see these beautiful pastures, these vineyards today in Galilee. And you know, many of us, we love vineyards, <laughs> Why? Because they make? Ah, uh, you said it. You said it. You've been to a vineyard? What are you doing drinking wine? Right? And everyone's like, oh, easy. Isn't that Jesus' first miracle? It is. It's this beautiful picture of banquet and bounty. Now, drunkenness is a sin. Don't mistake that for one minute. But God has this beautiful covenantal love that's represented by new wine. And so as we're thinking about vineyards and wine, wine never happens unless fruit bears on the vine, right? And if you've ever been to a vineyard, does the vine grow on the ground in the dirt? No, it grows on a trellis. It grows on a framework. It's this inanimate object that's meant for human flourishing. It's this inanimate object that's meant for the flourishing of the vine. And Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Jesus gives us the law as this framework, as this trellis, and he lays himself upon it as the vine, and he invites us to graft our lives into him as the vine. We're the branches pulling life from the vine so that we can bear fruit, bountiful, beautiful fruit that greater Portland tastes and understands that the Lord is good. Fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. All of these are fruits of the Spirit of God living inside of us. Jesus is saying, come graft yourself into me. The framework is there and I'm the vine. John, the, the author, the recorder of Jesus' words in that moment also writes in the first chapter, the word was made flesh to dwell among us. 
that his commands, his word, and his availability through his life in the vine are this invitation for us to abide in him. You wonder why we talk about abiding so much. It's because it leads to life. Everything apart from him is death. And you might not taste this death on this side of heaven. But I assure you, apart from Jesus, there is death. There is death. It's like trying to grow a vine in the dirt. It gets trampled on. It gets abused. The fruit's ripped from it. It never thrives. And yet the framework that God had given was such that Jesus could fulfill the law, lay himself on as the vine, and say, come graft yourself into me. This is where you draw life from. It's from his blood. It's from his word. It's from his command. You know, and Moses, Moses was giving down the law to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy. He gives the whole law, lays it all out for the people of Israel. And this is how Moses finished. He said to them, take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They're not just idle words for you. They are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. This morning, a young man named Michael was baptized as he declared Jesus was Lord. It was a month ago that I was sitting in the Connect East Point session in Discover East Point that happens once a month, hearing people's stories. And as we ran around the table, I was just fascinated of all these stories. And it got to Michael. And Michael introduced himself. He says, my name's Michael. And I've come to understand that this Bible, these words are life. And I said, amen, you're preaching next weekend. <laughs> right. These words are life. These are not idle words. This isn't some Bible or book to collect dust on your shelf. If it is, you're missing out on the, new, the nourishment and the sap and the life that flows out of Jesus. These 66 books are the Holy Spirit inspired canon of God that's meant to form and fashion us, dividing both joint and marrow, soul and spirit, so that we might be conformed into his image. And if we try to do this without this Bible, woe to us. This is our authority. Moses says, they are not just idle words for you. They are your life by them, by these words, not by our, our strategy, not by our intelligence, not by our giftedness, not by anything that we do. By them, you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. And if we think we're gonna make an impact here in Greater Portland, if we think that we're gonna make an impact in our families' lives, in our neighborhoods, in all these places, and we don't live our lives in alignment with this word, if we don't live into just consuming the bread of life that this word is, we have no chance. We have no chance. And I think William Bradford knew that as they were coming over on the Mayflower. Unless we're here for the glory of God, we have no chance. And today, 400 years later, my Uncle Neil still preaches the gospel faithfully in Plymouth. There's still gospel presentation happening week by week in Plymouth. It's just like Portland, Maine. Who is going to still be the light on the hill and the salt of the earth over the next 100 years here in Greater Portland? Is it going to be us? Is it going to be this church that's proclaiming the very same gospel that inspired them to come to this land? And I know there's a bunch of broken history thereafter, but what I do know is I look at the journal entries of the 30 years that Bradford was the governor of that region, and I know that he sowed seeds of prayer, gospel hope, and deep conviction in New England, and we are bearing it as a result. Great revivals have come through this region. We've experienced renewal, and I know that someday soon these dry bones in New England will come to life in Jesus' name. I know that people are gonna come alive, and there's a groundswell happening all around us. There's a, there's a shaking down of the church to get rid of the idols, to get rid of the culture that we've adopted from the Egypts of our lives, to say we have to live in the command and ordinances of a holy God if we're going to experience his holy presence here in our midst. And many of us are like, I just came to get inspired this morning. I got like a brunch. <laughs> I say this with all humility. What will choke us out are the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth. Graham talked about it earlier. 
that will choke out our church. That'll choke me out. I get the mail, right? I love getting mail. I'm like a, an embodied seven-year-old. Like, I love mail. It says my name on it, and I'm like, oh, yes. I don't read at the top that it says Gorm Savings Bank, right? <laughs> and I'm like, wait, they must have got the zeros wrong. <laughs> right? And is that the moment when I'm like, oh, man, I've got some, some wealth anxiety, some financial anxiety. Do I just hit my knees and go, Lord, I'm putting it all at your feet? Or do I walk around saying, Ashley, we're selling it all. <laughs> we're selling everything. Right? The, the worries of this world, the deceitfulness of wealth binds us up, holds us captive from being the people God has set us apart to be. And Jesus is declaring this on the Sermon on the Mount to these people in Galilee who feel so disqualified, but he's pointing them back. Their pursuit has to be one of holiness and righteousness. But to close out the word, this is the path to the kingdom. The word is a lamp unto my feet the light unto my path. This is what this is for you and I. We must take the word seriously. And then Jesus goes on. He gets through the commands, and then he really sets up a few people. And this can get confusing for the church sometimes. Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness, remember that word, righteousness, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice he didn't say behavior. Notice he didn't say deeds. Your righteousness. What about the Pharisees? These are the crooks, right? These are the guys we always tee up and try to hit grand slams with and say, don't be like the Pharisees. And yet Jesus is seemingly comparing the people Israel to the Pharisees. Have you ever had someone in your life, maybe a father figure, mother figure, or a coach say, just do as I say and not as I do. Does that bother you as much as it bothers me? I hated that. And I'm like, that's unfair, dad. But there was something to it, right? He had good intentions. He had good aspirations. He was even inviting me to live in a way that he probably couldn't keep up with. But when he failed under his own standards, I was like, you, there it is. Did you just call me a hypocrite? <laughs> it's it's true. It's true. We all can't live up to these standards that we set for ourselves. Some of us feel that weight and pressure all the time. The gap between what we hope for and who we really are is the gap in our righteousness. Right? This idea that Jesus is saying, I don't care about your duties. I don't care about all of the things you've done. I don't care about all your accolades. It's your inner righteousness. Going back to the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And he's teasing on that hunger. Are you hungry for the accolades and the trumpet blasts and the parading around of the Pharisees? Or are you hungry for this inner righteousness that bears fruit in your life? Jesus is our righteousness. His inherent value and his inherent holiness and his glory is our righteousness for those of us in Christ Jesus. For the Pharisees, they thought their duties and their religion and all of the things that they instituted as heavy yokes on people, that would be righteousness. That's self-righteousness. Right? We, all, we all know there's, there's two people in this world, if you really take a look at it. I had a pastor kind of reveal this to me this last week. And I said, that's genius. So there's two people. One person walks into a room, sizes the room up, and says, hey, here I am. It's all about me. Might be a little false humility in there a little bit of self-righteousness, but you know, you can sniff it out. And then there's the people that walk in the room and they say, there you are. Oh, I'm all about you. There you are. I'm all about you. That's who Jesus is. He doesn't walk in the room and parade around and say, come look at me. He says, I've come to do the will of my father. There you are. I'm all about you. I'm willing to take your pain, take your sin, take your rebellion, and I'm willing to take it to the cross because I'm all about you. The Pharisees are walking around with their tassels, their phylacteries, all these things that we don't even understand and saying, look at me. It's all about us. And Jesus says, look at you. I'm all about you. And so he says to his disciples, he says, come to me, all you who are weary, and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will, you will, it's a promise from him, find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is not an egg yoke, church. <laughs> Imagine two massive oxen teamed up together under this beam across their backs, compounding efforts, pulling heavy loads. And the Pharisees, they related their teaching, their disciples to a heavy yoke. And they said, you wanna do life with me? You wanna do life with a Pharisee or a Sadducee? You come bear the weight of this yoke because it's heavy. You're gonna have to earn your stripes. You're gonna hustle your way through life. You're gonna have to gut it out long days grinding. Jesus says, my yoke, it's easy. My burden is light. Taking that earning, striving pressure off of people's backs and saying the law was never meant to be this heavy burden upon you. And yet man's corruption has turned it in to feeling like you're trying to pull with an ox. And Jesus says, don't worry, I'll pull the weight for you. Right, Jesus, I don't want to miss this, but by the, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, the Lord said through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 6, if you can throw that up, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. You will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. This is what it looks like when Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I know you're at a crossroads. I know you're trying to make a decision. He says, come to me. I'll give you rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And in Jeremiah, he says to the Israelites, you chose not to take me up on it. These ancient paths are the paths I've established since the very beginning in the garden. I just wanted to dwell with you. And yet you said, we won't walk in that. Church, stand at the crossroads of this culture in today's times and look. Ask for the ancient way, the ways of Jesus, and walk in them. Walk in the ways of Jesus, the ways of righteousness. It's the essence of his kingdom. Don't try to pull at the things that bring worries in your life, deceitfulness of wealth, all the things that cause chaos and confusion in our lives. Lay them down and walk in the good way the way of the shepherd, the way of the one who said, I'm not only going to take your yoke, I'm going to take up my cross. The heaviest beam you could imagine placed on a human back was a Roman crucifix to walk up a hill called Calvary where Jesus says, I'll take the weight of this load, my friends, so that way you can live in resurrection power on the other side of the resurrection. He puts that yoke on his back. He says, you don't have to do a darn thing. Just receive the gift. How glorious is Jesus? How mighty is Jesus? How gracious is our King that He would come into our life and say, I so want to dwell with you. I know the law is not going to do what, I, what, it, what it was intended to do. That's why I set it up so I could fulfill it by the power of the cross and the resurrection. I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to lay my life down on the trellis so you can graft yourself into me and you can be bearing fruit as a result of the life I give you by the power of the Spirit. Jesus, in the beginning of this whole message, I want to re just reiterate that Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until, the hev until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything's accomplished. And it was accomplished on Calvary for you and me. That Jesus is looking forward to the day that the new Jerusalem exists here on earth where heaven passes away, earth passes away, all that we know completely passes away and that there's this new Jerusalem established with Jesus as the king, this simple, beautiful, righteous kingdom. And yet we don't have to wait for the not yet. We can live in the here and now where he said, I took the void away between you and me by stepping into your life and defeating sin, death, and hell on your behalf. 
And he said, let me take up the weight of your sin. Come to me. Let me teach you my ways, the ancient good paths that lead to righteousness. And Paul is looking at his friends up in Rome after he understands what it means for the gospel to fulfill the law. Paul says, I'm a Pharisee above Pharisees. All of these things I consider garbage. All of the things that I did because Jesus Christ fulfilled everything I tried to create in my own life by the law. So live by the power of the Spirit. And he comes into Rome and he's trying to remind all these people that have some context of Hebrew culture. He says, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What Yahweh instituted as the law for his people Israel, Jesus fulfilled by his work on the cross and his death and resurrection from the grave and the Holy Spirit now comes to not just fill the framework of our home, but to create an abode for you and I to dwell within. Holy Spirit says, let me come make my home within you. Let me fill and flood you beyond measure like oil that flows into a cup and begins overflowing. Let me fill you so that you might bear fruit Paul says, crucify your flesh and walk in step with the Spirit. All the fruit bears as a result. And that's the invitation to the church today. Does greater Portland taste the sweet, beautiful, bountiful fruit that comes from a church that's alive in Jesus Christ? And it comes back to abiding. It comes back to our time in His Word. It comes back to our time in prayer comes back to our time, 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 compounded time. And if you want to ask me what's made me so uncorked this morning, it's my time in the Word. It's my time with Him. It's the near decade of just consuming His Word and praying to the Spirit and asking Him to fill and flood me. And I'm not a perfect person. I am a hypocrite. But I know His words lead to life. And I'm going to pursue him. My invitation is for each and every person that's sitting in this room to do the same. Because over time, that vine delivers life that you have no idea about. And fruit begins to bear slowly and beautifully and abundantly in your life as you abide in Christ Jesus. He came to usher in his fulfilled kingdom. The law, because of Jesus and by his spirit, is the fulfillment of the kingdom of God here in greater Portland. And so as we look at communion today, as we, as we reflect on the covenant, I think of William Bradford coming across with the pilgrims and he chose the word covenant in a very specific way, not law, order, contract, constitution. He said covenant, an unfailable promise that if one person fails, the other is resolved not to. These people made a covenant. And Jesus has his disciples at his table. He says, I'm ushering in a new covenant, a new law, new wine. That when we're washed by his blood, our sin is cast as far as the east is from the west. No more sacrificing goats or bulls. No more water offerings. No more grain offerings. No more baptism for cleansing day by day. No, Jesus says once and for all, eat my flesh, drink my blood. This is the way of my disciples, remembering that it was finished on the cross. And so as we take the bread this morning, Jesus took a loaf of bread and that final dinner, he broke it. He blessed it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. We take the bread. And the cup of the new covenant, the unfailing promise of God through his son, Jesus Christ, for those of us who believe, 
Those of us who declare that Jesus is Lord, this is for you and me, that our sin is as far as the east is from the west. We're washed white as snow when we come to him in repentance. He took the cup at that last supper, said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Drink in remembrance of me. Take the cup. Ah, Jesus, we are so unworthy. We are so unworthy of your gift. We're so unworthy of your love. We're so unworthy of your desire to dwell among your people, and yet you never failed. What the law couldn't do, you did by your blood. What your blood fulfilled in us, you fill us by your spirit. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just minister to our hearts this morning. My words are not enough. God, remind us of your promises. Remind us of what it's like to abide and obey and have fullness of joy. Rest for our souls. Deep encounters with you by your spirit. Give us your word. Just sow our hearts with your person and your presence, Jesus. Minister to us in this place. May we not leave here unchanged by your mighty hand this morning. Oh, Lord, we love you. We thank you. We, we give ourselves, this family, to you that you would make us more and more potent like the salt of the earth and more and more radiant like the light of the world that this community, this region, these people here in southern Maine don't know what to do with a radiant, potent church here in Portland, Maine. Oh, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing and we ask for more of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, would you please stand as you're able and join me as we worship our King, our King of the simple kingdom.
Father, we forever, 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 holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, oh, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, we just worship you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your spirit, and I thank you for this church body. Raise us up. Graft us in. Bear fruit in our lives as we live from here, continuing to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you want to know about who we are, if you want to get plugged into this, this family, meet us over at Discovery East Point. If you're like, I don't know what to do with this morning, this message, this guy, <laughs> bring it to the prayer team. Let them help sift it out. Look for the ancient way. Ask the good way. We have to bring that to the Lord. We have to ask Him. Let Him direct your steps. And if you want to get baptized today, if you know this is the next step, I'm ready to lay my life down. This morning we had three people get baptized. Amen. Three people declare that Jesus is Lord. They were done with the world. And they said, I need a new king. I want this simple kingdom. Take me on a journey. We said, we'll do it together. So if that's you today, same thing applies. Death and resurrection, hope, all in one moment because of the condition in your heart. Otherwise, church, I just pray we continue to lean in. We let the kingdom saturate our hearts. We begin looking at every aspect of our lives as a kingdom opportunity. We begin envisioning and dreaming of what it looks like for his gospel to transform every heart in our midst. And we just start with one person. Pray for one person, talk with one person, love on one person, be a permeator of his kingdom, amen? Uh, have a great afternoon and we can't wait to see you Friday night or next week. <laughs>